Well, hello and welcome to Prophetic Perspectives, where we look at current events through the lens of the prophetic and through the lens of the Word of God. I'm Chris Reed, and I'm joined by my good friend, Ken Fish, who is the director of Orbis Ministries. And so we're glad that you're on the set and here at Morningstar with us, Ken. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks. It's great to be back. You know, we're continuing this conversation that we had last time about this dynamic of the power behind the throne. And we referenced the book uh, of Ezekiel. I believe it was uh, chapter 28. Yeah. About the prince of Tyra being this earthly, proud, arrogant, taking riches, thinking as if he's a god. Then the Lord brings judgment upon his arrogance through another nation. And then ultimately, it then moves down to say the king of Tyra and it's clearly not referencing just an earthly king. This is the cherub that was in Eden who was covered in stones. It's the evil one himself. That's correct. That's the king, so to speak, who is the power behind the throne of the prince, okay, of Tyra. And, and sometimes, by the way, that involved the producing of, of wealth. And, you know, sometimes the devil himself can also help people subjugate the powers of the earth, yeah. the principles of the earth to advance evil kingdoms. We've seen that over and over throughout history. Well, it's one of the temptations he threw at Jesus. Exactly. Right? It depends on whether you're reading Matthew or Luke, whether it was temptation two or three, but wherever it was, it, he threw this temptation at Jesus. He said all these things, and he showed, the, he showed him all the kingdoms of the earth and all their power and glory and wealth. And he said, all these things will I give you if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said, be gone, Satan. The scripture says, worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. But it was, it, obviously, it was, the scripture calls it a temptation. We know Jesus was without sin. He never succumbed to temptation. But it also says in scripture that Jesus was tempted in all manner as we ourselves are tempted which means that in the normal human condition as fallen men and women, not as the incarnate Son of God with no sin, we are tempted by power, wealth, and that sort of you know, notoriety. We want that. And so Satan throws that at Jesus. He endured without sin, but we unfortunately succumb to it. And one of the biggest uh, pools for that is politics. There's been you know, big population studies done on this phenomenon that a lot of people are talking about in, in the news, in modern psychology, called narcissism. Yeah. And narcissism occurs typically in about one in 50 people in the wider normal population of the earth, uh, about 2%, one in 50. But when you move up to leaders of big corporations, big business, and to politicians, it's one in three. Yeah. One in three. Well, narcissism is almost the consummate expression of that will to power, the desire to dominate, ruthlessness. It goes on and on. But, but anyway, where is that coming from? Well, again, many of these people may well be subjected to uh, these kinds of king-level spirits, and some of them have actually made their deal. I mean, I remember when the Rolling Stones, who I believe was the first rock band to, to make more than a billion dollars, and the Stones later said they made a deal. They made a pact with Satan that if he would make them rich and famous, they would promote him, and that's exactly what they did. Yeah, well, you know, you and I both uh, knew a minister who was well-known in the charismatic world, who was a prophet, uh, he told a story about how back in the 50s, in the prime of his ministry, that he was holding some services in a church in Hollywood. Mm. And, you know, he was looked to as a real true prophetic person, and, and he was developing this great following in Los Angeles. I believe it was in Los Angeles over by Hollywood. And one night, uh, he was having services in one of the well-known uh, theaters uh, there in in Los Angeles, and he called this man. His name was Joseph Blackburn. That's what the man introduced himself as. Anyways, this friend of ours, this mutual friend, um, 
said that he noticed this man sitting in the crowd all night and there was just something very drawing and appealing about him. It was just like you couldn't help but notice him or or your eyes to be drawn to him. And he said it was almost like some kind of supernatural drawing force. And at the end of the meeting, he came up and he told this friend of ours who is now deceased, but he said, uh, um, he says, I would like to have a meeting with you. And so he went up and met with him and he basically went into this whole conversation by saying, listen, I can make you into the most successful preacher that has ever existed. Mm. I have the power to do it. You already have a lot going for you. And basically, if you can acknowledge me, you know, as the source of it, if you can just acknowledge me, and he actually said, I'm the light of the world. He told this man that we both knew, <laughs> you know, he said, I'm the light of the world. And, and, and this man said, our friend, he said, in this whole meeting, he's like, I knew that something, this was not normal. Right. And it was right. like, it was like <laughs> I was under a strong influence of deception the whole time. And he said, this whole story ended because his, our friend's mother was downstairs praying for him. And he makes this statement. He says to Joseph Blackburn, he says, okay, I, I hear you say you're the light of the world. You're, you're as, acting as if you're the Savior. And he said, I would like for you to say these words, Jesus Christ is Lord. Because no man can say Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Spirit. And he's like, well, why are you, why are you trying to get me to say that? What's the big deal? Yeah. You know, it was like he was dancing around it. Finally, this Joseph Blackburn, that was what the name he gave to our friend. While he was leaving and walking out, uh, they went downstairs and this minister friend that you and I both had, his mother told him, he said, you just met for three hours with the devil himself. <laughs> And he said that when the man walked out off the main street there, the whole group of them saw him step onto the street and disappear into thin air. So I'm convinced that in Hollywood, in the music industry, in, even in the business world, and certainly in politics, there are many people who are there who are clearly probably not the most qualified, but they have uh, accepted the temptations that Adam and Eve accepted to make one wise, you know, to make someone feel as if, you know, they're like a God, that kind of thing. That's exactly what the serpent, you know, tempted Adam and Eve with. And so the the temptations Adam and Eve fell for uh, that Jesus did not fall for you know that gifted, unique people that the enemy would love to use to implement or reaffirm or reestablish these kings in the second heaven, you know, and have earthly representatives to keep the influence of hell in politics, in government, to keep a lot of the stuff going on that we see happening right now with this education of our children, with this flat out perversion. You know, this, this wokeism, this LGBTQ agenda, all of this stuff that's going on. In education right now, this, there's nothing that will call parents to see the need to get involved, to have a voice, to vote. You know, that's just one example. But all of this stuff that's going on right now in our nation, um, it makes you wonder how many of these politicians and singers and performers and artists have made some kind of pact or agreement, whether knowingly or not knowing, with hell. It makes you wonder how many of them have kept their seats, kept their position in power because of the practicing of the occult and and, and, and invoking powers from that second heaven to make sure that they keep their position on, on earth. Right, exactly. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. The big question is, how many of them are there, as you point out? And actually, I don't think there's any way to know it. We'll know on Judgment Day. Yeah. We'll definitely know on Judgment Day. But in the meantime, we'll know a tree by its fruit. And so when we see some of this stuff, you know, one of the big tactics that's employed is um, to bully people, to gaslight them, 
to make them feel less than, to mock and ridicule them. So there's there's both an enticement, but also kind of a what? A, how could you possibly believe that? And in fact, even as we're making this this TV show. Um, I'm sure that there would be people who are watching us thinking, what are these two guys talking about? They're out of their minds. There's no such thing as a spiritual realm. There's no such thing as a devil that would try to influence people in this manner. And yet, there's, there's plenty of contra evidence. It's just that in general, Christians don't traffic in that, so they are not as aware of what a great body of evidence there is for this other realm of power. For sure. Well, stay tuned. We're going to come back right after these uh, messages after this break. You don't want to miss the second half of this. I tell you, I'm really enjoying this conversation because I think it's explaining about why things are the way they are and why things are happening the way they're happening in the earth, in the world right now. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Rick Joyner. I wanted to share with you my new book, newest book that I just finished. It's called The Christian Duty to Resist Tyranny. And this is a book I did. It's uh, to a large degree a commentary, commentary on what is called the Doctrine of Lesser Magistrates, which during the Reformation gave authority or, you know, connected the Reformation to a biblical authority for resisting tyranny. Tyranny is coming at us from every direction right now. And we do have a sound biblical Christian duty to stand up to it. How we do that, why we do that is all crucial. And I address those crucial issues in this book. You don't want to miss what is in it. Well, welcome back to Prophetic Perspectives, and I'm joined again here by Ken Fish, who is a friend of me personally and a friend of Morningstar. And I think this conversation is only going to grow in steam in the body of Christ because people are really hungry. They're really desirous to know what is causing this, you know, the this ideology, this wokeism, this this LGBTQ advancement, this, I mean, all of the wacko, radical, extreme stuff. The common people, and by the way, there's just this recent poll that was done, very deep poll done with, I think, like over 3,000 people that um, a, a friend of our ministry conducted with uh, George Barna, and they found out America as a nation itself has not turned to the left. This was like 3,000 uh, people asking these people from all different demographics of, the, of our nation, Ken, that basically uh, asking them hundreds of questions, digging deep into their worldview. And here's the interesting thing, Ken, about this is America's always been about a six out of 10, a center-right nation. Yeah. This poll has, and we're going to be unfolding and talking more about this in the future, and you're going to hear a lot about this, but America's probably ever been a seven or leaning even to an eight now. And here's the reason why. A lot of people don't expect this. Because the, the news, the media, Hollywood, Silicon Valley, these are controlled by people who want us to think a certain thing. That's correct. To accept certain things and make us think as if the vast majority of people already think this way. Now that is the big deception going on right now is to get you and your family, your children to think that this leftist, woke, Marxist, worldview of sexuality, of all these different things, that it's normal. And actually, you're the one that's weird and wacko for not, you know, you're just out of touch, out of time, or you're racist, or whatever terminology they can, it's like throwing spaghetti, you know, on the wall. Anything they can get to stick, they want to try to get to stick. When in reality, it's a handful of 
media big tech guys and people who control the major news networks and control Hollywood. Now that consists of thousands of people, right. but we're talking in a nation of 340 plus million people, the grassroots of America still by and large loves their, they don't believe all that. They just are the, the people that control the channels and, and control the stream of news want all of us to think we all believe that. That's right. So again, back to where we started this conversation in the last session, yeah. we've got what's happening on earth here and we see all that, but it's reflecting what's going on up here. So all of everything you said from wokeism to Marxism to transgenderism to whatever, um, by the way, I often say that if it ends in ism, it might be a demonic ideology. So just kind of keep that in your mind. But all that you're seeing down here is an indication of godlessness. It's a departure from the ways of the Lord that's going on in the spiritual realm. And it's underway, but the, it's, it's not been a wholesale seduction yet. They're working on it. They're trying to get there. And going back to something I mentioned earlier, um, it's easy to use Hitler as an example. He's pretty well universally vilified and understood to be yeah. the embodiment of all that's wrong. He had a man whose title was Minister of Propaganda. His name was Joseph Goebbels, or Goebbels if you say it in proper German. Joseph Goebbels had a, a, a famous quotation. People can fact check this. He said, tell a lie long enough and sooner or later people will believe it. And so what's happening is that it's almost like a propaganda effort that's underway. So there's, there's a lot of that same sort of dynamic happening right now in the intellectual ferment of our country at this time. And all of it reminds me of what it says in Psalm 2, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? And then it says the kings of the earth take their stand. Well, we talked about king level spirits with Ezekiel 28 and this king of Tyre, which is the spiritual ruler, yeah. influencing the prince of Tyre, who is the earthly ruler. So these kings are taking their stand against the Lord and against his anointed one. This is the stirring of the ancient gods. It's the very thing Jonathan Kahn wrote about in that book on the return of the gods. So we are seeing, I would say, a, a multi-dimensional convergence going on. Yeah. And the main dimensions are here on the earth and up there in the, in the heavens. And, you know, Jesus said this would happen at the end of time. And he even said that the powers of the heavens would be shaken. Mm -hmm. This is uh, explicitly stated in Matthew 24. I don't remember the verse, but it's there in Matthew 24. And so they're, they're, because they're being shaken, now they're riled up. Now they're like, oh my gosh, our time is short. And so all of this is really one indicator for us that I don't know that it's tomorrow, but sometime pretty soon Jesus really is coming back. People have been saying that for 2,000 years, but this is really, we're down into the end of days now. Oh, for sure. And like you were talking about the minister of propaganda for, for Hitler, I mean, it would have been his job to make people believe the narrative. That's it. That would justify his actions. And, you know, we have a propaganda uh, minister here in the United States. It's it's called CBS <laughs> or CNN, CNN or NBC, or M MSNBC, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Uh, and and you know they tell a lie long enough, they think that a large enough portion of the nation will believe it, and they'll show up on election day. But I, I think more and more people are waking up to the deception of the news. They really are, yeah. and 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 less people than ever trust the news. And I I think that what we are seeing is. The deception, and by the way, it actually says in the book of Revelation that there would come a time Satan would come down with great wrath. Mm -hmm. No, come down from where? The very place you're talking about. Right. The second, not That's the right. third heaven That's where right. God abides, but the second heaven where all spiritual warfare is taking place. And the spiritual warfare in the second heaven ultimately wants to duplicate on earth as it is in the second heaven. That's right. But we have to decide whether we're, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The devil's desire is to, is to bring to pass on earth as it is in the second heaven. It's God's desire for us to implement on earth as it is in the third heaven. That's correct. And that's ultimately what the kingdom age is going to look like when the rule and domain and the kingship of Jesus Christ 
with us, the king priest, him being the chief king priest, when he returns, he will finally uproot, okay, and and completely disrupt these long-term principalities who have had strongholds in the earth. He will finally dethrone these kings of the earth. That's correct. We talked about in Ezekiel 28 and in Psalms 2, and they will be cast in the, the pit of darkness and bound. That's why there'll be peace on the earth. That's why, you know, even the animal kingdom, you know, the child will play with the poisonous snake, the wolf and the lamb lying down together because so many of the things that were a result of the fall and the influence of the snake or the serpent in the garden, all of those effects, I mean, we're going to see the cross and what Jesus did at the cross in the kingdom age to come, we'll see the full reaching effects of what he accomplished at the cross. That's exactly correct. It's working out now in our personal lives, in the church. And you know, this brings up one last point, Ken, and that is this discussion. Uh, and and I'm, I'm, I'm aware we've got just a couple of minutes left, but this discussion over dominion theology that in contrast to that with an end-time eschatology, dominion theology, Ken, would basically say, and by the way, many of our, our, our founders believed a form of dominion theology. They thought when they established America that it was going to be like the new Jerusalem or the new Israel. But the modern dominion theology that is infiltrated in many of the spirit-filled camps believe that we will ourselves, through the power of the Holy Spirit, dethrone all of these thousands of year long principalities ingrained in cultures and in regions of the earth, that we'll finally do it by winning enough elections uh, with the right candidates or by making these reformations. Whereas the other point of the view, and I'm by the way, I'm not a dispensationalist, right. but the other point of view says there's going to be two kingdoms uh, the sons of the righteous one, the sons of the wicked one are going to come into full maturity. The wheat and the tare will come into full matur maturity. At the time of the great harvest, it's going to get darker and darker. The wicked will do more wickedly um, while the righteous do more righteously. And then when it looks like the world is lost, Jesus will return and set up His kingdom on the earth and we will be victorious. Now, this dominion theology is is really this is how I explain it because we get asked this question a lot. Here's what I tell people. We need to think, to preach, to evangelize as if dominionism is true, but ultimately know that it's not. Hmm. Let me explain what I mean by that. We need to be here to occupy. We need to we need to get out and vote. We need to preach as if we're taking cities and a nation can be saved in a day. We need to think as if we can do that or we're put here, but ultimately know it will not be accomplished completely or fully until a second coming happens. And so, because if you don't see it this way, then the church many times, like it has in years gone by, just takes a defeatist mentality. But yet the other extreme basically says, you know, that, that there's almost going to be like another uh, crusades, you know, right. like in the hundreds of years ago. So once again, this is an example, Ken, where we have authority over principalities and powers. God has given us, us, not individually, but us. We can, by His direction, uh, address principalities and powers. We certainly as individuals have power over demons Absolutely. to cast and drive out demons. And every time a demon is cast out, and I'm so inspired by your ministry, and I've got to minister with you a number of times now, and I've seen you uh, drive out demons, and, and you know what you're doing is you are one square inch of dirt at a time <laughs> taking the earth back for the kingdom of God. We're trying to, yeah. We're driving the forces of darkness back until the second coming, until finally Jesus Himself says, well done, my good and faithful servants. You did all that you could do, but now I'm coming and I myself are going to set up my kingdom on the earth. That's and right. What a day that's going to be. That's right. I'm Absolutely. looking forward to it. One other thing that I think has to be mentioned here, we aren't just doing the works of Jesus, healing, deliverance, right. etc. Um, but part of our calling as believers 
is to administer whatever metron we've been given, which whether it's big or small, it kind of depends on where we're positioned, where God has given us gifting, where we've been made uh, to fit yeah. in the earth. No matter where our metron is, no matter what that metron is, we must always act righteously. Always act righteously. Yeah. Even at cost to ourselves, if it comes to that. You know, there were certain people who gave up their lives resisting Hitler during yep. the, that period of time. And so, you know, there are times when we find ourselves in the workplace and maybe there's an unrighteous policy there in the company. Don't support that policy. Work to overturn it. Make it so that everybody gets equal treatment, whether it's in their wage or because of their skin color, they get equal treatment, whether they're white or black or brown or yellow or red or blue if they're a Smurf. But no matter what they do, they, you know, we act righteously and we must, as believers, I really feel strongly about this, we must be unassailable in our righteousness. Yeah. And the reason I say that is Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will assuredly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. So we can't bring the kingdom of heaven by being the bad news, we have to be the good news. Yeah. And what that means is we have to inspect our own lives and we have to be on the lookout for in our sphere of influence where there are pockets still of unrighteousness of the devil's economy and we have to stop that in its tracks speak up be counted make a difference it is not enough it is not okay to be passive in the face of evil when it's happening around you because those pockets of influence in our sphere that go unchallenged long enough will eventually become a stronghold they will absolutely they and will so Wow, what a conversation. We've just scratched the surface. I know. <laughs> but Ken, I really appreciate you. Thank you for uh, being on uh, Prophetic Perspectives with us today. And, and I know you're going to be here in a few months for School of the Prophets. I believe in, uh, I believe it's in April of 2023. Yeah. And so we're excited every time that you're here. And thank you so much for joining us again today. Yep. And I pray this message and this teaching, this conversation has blessed you. Tell others about it. And please check us out at Morningstar TV. Uh, you can find us there and, and find everything that Morningstar is producing. And these programs will encourage you and bless you and tell others about prophetic perspectives. And until next time, I'm Chris Reed coming from Morningstar Ministries with my special guest Ken Fish today. God bless you. We'll see you next time.